from new technologies to health, the environment um, and to innovation. He works closely with international colleagues to advance the understanding of Indigenous data sovereignty and with government agencies, institutions and tribal organisations to enhance Indigenous data governance. Um, and then on to developing policies, tools and mechanisms that operationalise Indigenous data sovereignty. I personally am very much looking forward to hearing more about your work, so please join me in welcoming Maui Hudson. Uh, kia ora everyone, uh, nice to be here. Thanks to uh, uh, Ellie and Shelley and the, the Tewa team for the invitation. First time in Hobart, so um, great to be here. Feels a little bit like the colder parts of New Zealand. So, um, but, but as beautiful, as beautiful as our country as well. Um, yeah, I had to bring up my computer as well because I was a bit worried about if this, if this thing doesn't work, I haven't got any notes and I'm just have to go into storytelling mode. But um, it's, I think it's uh, been really interesting to be here and to start talking about, or to start thinking about this topic around Indigenous provenance and biodiversity records. Um, and it might look like a little bit of a dance if I keep pointing at the person to move the slides forward. Who's somewhere in the room, which I'm hoping they'll do. Ah, well, back one, back one. So he goes back one. I oh, yeah, just cool. one. That's good. Thank you. Um, just wanted to make uh, some acknowledgements, uh, support my acknowledgements, and celebrate the Muwanina and the Palawa people uh, on whose traditional lands we meet and pay respects to elders past and present. Uh, I want to acknowledge and celebrate uh, the Waikato Tainu, which is the people whose lands where I live. And so just thinking about different ways in which acknowledgements can be made. And also acknowledging uh, my community. Uh, so ko māke o te maunga, ko waiwa te awa, uh, ko mātātua te waka and ko whakatoi tiwi. So that's uh, my community. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see some of the pictures um, of uh, where I live, which is also a coastal region. Um, and one that's uh, started to get quite involved in aquaculture. So it's been really interesting being here in Hobart, knowing that's a big, uh, big part of uh, the work that happens around here as well. Uh, next slide. Um, so kind of going into, I, I really don't need this slide. This was a slide from that I did uh, working with a colleague of mine, Libby Liggins, um, and she was talking about just a big increase. Oh yeah. Oh, that one. Oh, look at that person. I'm in control now. Um, so a big increase in the uh, sort of the amount of data. And I think Jess's um, presentation showed that. And really, that's all That's all we were kind of wanting to get across. Um, but I think there's a part of it that while we're creating this sort of massive data resources um, and generating this information at ever and ever increasing rates, um, like how are we making it available for reuse and what does that then contribute to? And some of the contributions are in a sort of a policy space and that was sort of talked about, um, but it's also in commercial areas. And some of the things that people talked about with collection events and the increase in genetic information is where is that rolling through in terms of kind of value creation um, spaces? And so that's created this a bit of anxiety around what does fair and equitable benefit sharing look like in this kind of environment? And so not only thinking about how data is being shared, but sort of the responsibilities for that to then connect back to communities where it came from. And so um, discussions that are happening around the Nagoya Protocol uh, is, is one of the areas, particularly in relation to digital sequence information, and then the care principles for Indigenous data governance, which I'll talk about, but there's a session following as well, is something that's also um, in the space of really Indigenous data sovereignty and what that means in terms of enhancing greater or promoting indigenous control of indigenous data. So uh, in and of itself, it's, it's really a discourse about rights and interests. And we think about that, um, I guess, or maybe you think about that in the context of uh, the data platforms that get put together and whether data can be shared openly. And there's often different sorts of conversations, which might be ones from the research teams uh, around what information they're making available. It could be information being collected from, uh, say, commercial entities that are doing work in different places. So it could be shipping vessels. Um, we've been involved in a project in New Zealand that was looking at um, modelling marine heat waves 
Uh, they put sensors on fishing vessels that they were going down with the gear. Of course, the, fishers, uh, the fishermen don't want to tell everyone exactly where they're fishing and, and getting their information, but they had to come to agreements around how do we get the information we can use it for the purposes we want, but obscure it enough so that people's privacy, whether it's commercial or otherwise, can be maintained. And we can kind of think about that same thing often in relation to uh, the interests or cultural stories or interests around places where they might collect food or other stories that, that relate to connections they have with the environment as well. So as, as we've been engaging in this process of thinking about what the um, different rights groups might have in relation to the sharing of data, Indigenous communities are saying, what about us? Where do we fit in this conversation about you know, how, th how things can be shared? Oh, we're going to jump back. And so part of... Um, Backwards, it's going forwards. Okay, can you go backwards? We have control. One more, one more, one more. Cool. Is is really these two big themes, um, and in lots of ways they align with uh, some of the thinking around um, the fair principles as well. But really, how do people get access to data so that it can support their decision making? That's what we think about as data for governance. And then, as that information is being made more available for others when should you be involved in deciding you know how it should be shared and so the governance of data and so they've become these two sort of major themes in the space um, so then it gets to what are indigenous data and certainly i'm presenting um, the position that uh, the various indigenous data sovereignty networks put across so it's kind of a very indigenous position and this comes from the u.s indigenous data sovereignty network but thinking about uh, data about resources and environment, uh, data about individuals, things collected about um, the members of the community. So that could be health, all sorts of education information, but then data about their collectives. And so I just want to make the point here is that part of that is the traditional knowledge part. And we often think about there's interest around the traditional knowledge as it relates to places, but there's also just interest in the data that comes from the environment itself, not not about its, its sort of traditional knowledge component because that also informs how those resources and those places get used kind of independently. And so these, um, I think these, these things need to be thought about and we'll kind of get to that as I get a little bit further along as well. Um, cool. And just highlighting um, that even, even within Indigenous communities, there's this kind of a, a sort of tension or competing interest around the things that uh, they would like to see and the things that they think are important. Go. Next slide. Thanks. Um, and it comes about because we're you know, making efforts in a lot of places to increase Indigenous participation in research, science and technology. And as we get involved in these spaces, we want to start um, kind of see how can those tools and technologies support the things that we want to do. Um, and that means that there will, be, there will be support for open data and open science when it's in that sort of situation where it supports those aims. Um, at the same time, there's the kind of balancing part of that about wanting to protect um, interests and the aspirations they have around Indigenous data sovereignty. So in some ways, the goal is Indigenous communities want to be able to benefit from innovation and development. This thing is jumping around all over the place via greater control of indigenous knowledge and indigenous data. And so it's a way for them to become a part of uh, the activities that are going on and knowing that research is one of those areas that actually drives a lot of development. So if you're not involved in that part, you're often going to miss out of, you know, where the, you know, kind of trajectories into the future sit. So uh, thinking about, um, like a lot of indigenous data sovereignty is, is, is the conversations around it have got very focused on the control of the data and sort of ownership sort of elements. But in most of the instances, we know that all of the, the information which you're dealing with isn't sitting on an indigenous land. It's not sitting in an indigenous controlled organization. So their ability to participate starts to be around how can they be involved in the governance of that activity, the, the rules and, and things that get set in place. And so that's why we uh, worked on uh, as a part of the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, which is this network of uh, Indigenous data sovereignty groups um, that have really 
thinking about advancing indigenous data sovereignty and governance and really promoting indigenous control of indigenous data. And so part of that was actually putting together the care principles for indigenous data governance. So before this thing flicks across and just did, <laughs> there's, the, um, there's the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Collective. And I know in New Zealand, there's been a, a lot of discussion on sort of policy groups about Indigenous data sovereignty. I understand the same thing's happening here in New Zealand. And even internationally, there's um, different pockets where that conversation has moved along. And uh, that uh, was partly behind the development of the care principles for Indigenous data governance. And um, they were put in place in part because uh, you can see the fair principles there. So it was great that Jess kind of brought that up in her talk. Um, but when we looked at those principles, the, the fair principles are about the characteristics of the data. So they're data centric. You know, what does, what does it look like? And we saw the care principles, or at least when we looked at indigenous principles, they tended to be more about the purpose and the people. And so we see the both sets of principles as being complementary and um, had our kind of our tagline, be fair and care um, when you're working with when you're working with data. Uh, so these elements around collective benefit, authority, control, responsibility and ethics um, are the ones that uh, really start needed to be thought about, I guess, in the context of in the context of making data available. And so they've been picked up um, kind of in a variety of places. Um, we've had them translate into uh, a range of different languages. Uh, and they've we go here. I'm not even sure what the next slide is until it comes up. Oh yeah including, and it started to emerge in a whole range of different kind of policy documents um, in the UN, but also kind of locally. And this is the IATSIS Code of Ethics uh, for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. They've got a section um, here around indigenous leadership and indigenous knowledge and data. And as a part of that, they've got a section that talks about um, ensuring that, that data is in, uh, used in a manner that's consistent with the fair and care principles. And there you go. Look at that, just down the bottom. Uh, and so, so it's been really useful, at least in terms of being able to um, highlight um, issues around uh, Indigenous data governance uh, in some of these spaces because uh, there's so much work that's focused on operationalizing fear and how that supports open data and open science. Uh, and so next week, the International Data Week, um, there's going to be another session um, focusing on care as well and different things that are going on in uh, places around the world. So uh, they were put into place in 2019. And so what's been happening since then is really starting to think about great as a set of principles, but what does it look like in practice? What can you do? What can people do? to start to um, enable or respect the care principles in the way in which they operate. And there's a few things which we'll kind of talk about how that is, how that's been coming about. Uh, these are a couple of papers that have come up recently. that are talking about uh, data governance principles, influencing participation in biodiversity science, um, and also thinking about the care principles in relation to ecology and biodiversity research starting to kind of think through and make suggestions about uh, things that can be put into place. And alongside that, there's also, you know, a range of different sorts of conversations that are going on. And so one of the things I want to stress around this is um, it hasn't been sorted out. A little bit like, you know, a little bit like a lot of uh, the areas, you know, doing work in the Antarctic and other places, you're trying to move forward from the position you've got with the information you've got at hand, but head in a direction. And at the moment, I think the care principles are pointing a direction, but they haven't worked out what all those kind of criteria and things look like from a practical point of view. So there, um, uh, so not only is, is there sort of bits and pieces of work going on, but there's these different conversations happening. And this is uh, one that actually there's one that was uh, last month, there's another one that's coming up at the end of this week, actually on Friday, 
but still thinking about what does you know data governance and data sovereignty look like in the context of setting up a national reference library for eDNA. So the same sorts of probably different conversations that are happening in, in other places as well. So that's in New Zealand. And also, you know, thinking about um, how it translates then into what kinds of fields sit within um, uh, within records. And this is part of the metadata manifest that the European Reference Genome Atlas have put together as they're starting to think about what do they need to do to recognize indigenous provenance uh, within the context of um, you know, the work that they're doing. So, um, uh, yeah, so my disclaimer around um, before anyone asks me questions is I was originally a physiotherapist and now I'm um, now I'm talking about metadata and it, it's, there's at some point there's some kind of logical pathway to how that came about but um, I think that would take too long to describe but I think you know obviously this this is kind of the area which which um, you guys are working in all the time and what it's essentially come from is thinking about if we want to have um, what is the right, what's the right sort of information that sits within the records that allow indigenous communities to access that material in ways that make sense to them? Okay, so, and I've got all your kind of taxonomy and, and, and other fields that really researchers in the science community have decided that's important for us in terms of how we access and use that information. If we're trying to increase the availability of data uh, beyond that and into kind of public spaces as well, then we have to try and think about what sort of enabling infrastructures we have in place to allow that to happen. And so the Indigenous Metadata Bundle, um, on the back, I went back a slide, there was the link to the place where um, this sort of document is. And this is just emerged out of a conversation we had earlier this year, uh, uh, Indigenous Metadata Symposium, that was trying to um, start thinking through this often with you know a bunch of people that are involved in kind of biodiversity records in different ways and think about what sort of information is going to be useful and these at the in the first instance are the five areas that have come up information about governance provenance lands and waters uh, protocols and local context notices and labels which I'll, I'll talk a little bit about later on and then the table on the other side is really just some work that we were doing we were looking at different um, so this is the project for, for setting up the National uh, DNA Reference Library, eDNA Reference Library, and thinking about what sort of information sits within some of the other platforms that are around. And um, the sorts of things that indigenous communities have been indicating they would like to see and whether or not they are in place. But we just sort of map them against the, um, uh, the indigenous metadata bundle too. But this is sort of you know emerging work as well. I had to remove one of the slides because I knew we were going to have trouble with this. Uh, but it was it's really about a uh, the beginnings of trying to put together a standard around um, provenance for Indigenous peoples' data, and so working with the IEEE um, to develop a recommended practice around that. And that process is in train. And it's probably the first kind of standard in the space that's that we're trying to think about and trying to develop. But you know, there's obviously going to be um, lots more needed in this space as well. So um, someone will point at me around time. Uh, traditional knowledge and biocultural labels. Uh, they, these are really starting to try and think about what are some of the kind of practical things that can get put into place that start to kind of get on a path towards, um, towards that kind of intention that communities have around uh, greater participation. And so the traditional knowledge and biocultural notices and labels is a project I've been involved with for the last six or years, six years or so, working with local contexts. Um, it emerged out of so it emerged out of a space um, which was really around uh, indigenous communities themselves starting to collect the information, and a lot of time it was in a sort of a cultural heritage space. Uh, collect and store that on kind of content management systems that were controlled by indigenous communities. Um, and as a part of that, because they were often ingesting kind of records that were coming from other institutions, uh, they wanted to be in a position to um, indicate to those, uh, indicate in the places which they shared it, 
but in some of those source kind of source collections, what their interests were in relation to that material and their preferences around protocols and permissions. Now, what I'm talking about here in the first instance is really just um, sort of another component which we've developed, which is really around notices. And this is about the relationship that sits between uh, the communities and the platforms or those institutions. And what the institution can do in its, in its own right to say, hey, look, we're in a position where we're open to engaging with communities around these sorts of exercises. So there's lots of places where you can put together a pilot project. Um, you can work with a community to, to do something and kind of create something cool, but it often sits in that little bubble. And it's the ability of how do you translate that work in that bubble into the infrastructure so that then other communities can come and do the same sort of thing without having to go through a kind of another big development process. And that was the thing that I really liked about how um, uh, what had happened with the development of the labels and ended up getting involved. So we have these notices, um, ones that just saying, okay, we're happy to collaborate and engage with communities. And then these other ones that are around disclosures. And they're essentially saying, actually, we know that we've got this information. There's some interest in it, which we are not sure, you know, um, we can't clarify exactly what that is but you as a next user just need to be aware from it. It's kind of saying this isn't exactly like just public domain CCO. You can just go and do whatever you like with it. It's still there. It's still open, but there may be some interest that someone else is going to express. And for us, that's been a way for like a platform to, um, you know, you do your, well, do a disclaimer. That's sort of our disclaimer around what you can, um, well, what you can do. Um, so here's an example. So this is uh, Geome, uh, Genomic Observatory's metadata database. You can just see that um, on their front page, they have the open to collaborate um, notice sitting there. And this next one is the University of Maine. Uh, so they have a center for genetics and uh, the environment. So they have an open to collaborate notice, but also just indicating that as they're going around and doing sampling, that they're adding biocultural notices to that. So the biocultural notice was um, exactly what I uh, kind of hinted at the beginning around this kind of interest in traditional knowledge. But the interest in traditional knowledge relate to the traditional knowledge itself. So if the traditional knowledge is being put um, somewhere on the database and shared, then the protocols that relate to that are specific to that. If you're talking about the data that's been collected or generated off their lands that isn't traditional knowledge, the traditional knowledge protocols don't apply to it. So I've kind of got a different set of ideas or rules or thinking around how that information might be managed. And so, um, so these things can sort of uh, work independently or work together depending on what information is being shared in any particular place. So here's a set of traditional knowledge labels. Um, and really what I was uh, kind of wanting to talk to here is the sorts of things that it's trying to do. Um, so there's a set of labels there. And so all of these labels have been developed alongside communities um, as there's been particular projects um, and they've wanted to reflect something to uh, something, you know, in on the record. Uh, there's provenance labels, which uh, connect back to the community or the subset of the community, whether it's the clan or whether it's the, the family, um, where there are sort of responsibility for engagement around that material might sit. Um, or there's a recognition that there might be multiple communities involved. Um, there's a set that relate to protocols, uh, things that people have said around, maybe it's men's business, maybe it's women's business, maybe there's kind of seasonal uses um, that kind of sit in that space. And then there's some general permissions ones. So things like we're okay with this being used for outreach, educational use is fine, research use is fine, but we might have some different ideas around either not for commercialization or being open to commercialization. So kind of giving an indication about what sort of relationship they might like to have with other people in the future. Now this is, a, this is sort of an important part because any kind of consultation that's happened around the collection event has been with a certain set of people that have provided the information into the space, but then they're not the ones that are doing these other activities. 
because we're making it available for everyone else. So it might be the 10th user, it might be the 50th user, it might be the 100th user that identifies some kind of commercial opportunity and at least then they know where this sort of way of connecting might sit um, rather than having that kind of stripped out. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how this is um, kind of rolled around. And so there's a example here of what it looks like. So the icon itself stays the same, and it stays the same so it can be recognized across different jurisdictions or different institutions. Um, but the text that sits alongside it is customized by each of the communities. So you've got the icon and then you've got the text. That's how we try and get a balance between sort of like the, the local context and it being, being kind of usable and more of a kind of a global system. So here you can see um, uh, this is a community in British Columbia. Uh, it's information which they've put up as part of virtual museums in Canada. And uh, you can see that there's four labels that get represented. And when they click on the label, it shows up the text like you see here. And so this is how they just talk about what attribution means to them literally name and place and how they want to be recognized if people are using this information in other spaces. And this is an example of the labels in use on an app. Uh, so this is an app of traditional songs. Uh, this is from actually our community. We put it together so that most of our kind of members that live outside the area have got a, a way of kind of learning as well. But you can see it's kind of usable in a whole variety of places. These have been used on books, um, all sorts of kind of different formats as, as possible. And so, um, and then, then uh, we developed the biocultural labels. And this was a project that um, after, we got in, after I kind of connected around the traditional knowledge label and see how they applied, uh, we developed this alongside a project working with places like um, people from Manaki Whenua, uh, shout out to those people in the room as well, um, who have contributed to um, how that how that came about. Um, so here we have the same things, you know, in a different sort of way. There's sort of provenance as it relates back to back to communities. There's less protocols because there's what are the traditional protocols for how you share biodiversity data. You know, it's sort of not something that's kind of obviously come about. But here we think about ideas around consent and, you know, whether consent can be verified or not. There been lots of things collected from places where, you know, that wasn't necessarily done in the past. But as we're moving forward, there's sort of different sorts of expectations around what, what right looks like. And then permissions uh, in the same way. Um, uh, outreach, research, use, open to collaboration, open to commercialization becomes a way of also connecting um, future researchers with communities that might be open to engaging in more sorts of research activities as well. So trying to have it, uh, trying to have it be useful in terms of those communities being able to participate in activities, uh, research activities too. And so here I want to show um, where we've got to um, uh, with Manaki Whenua. And this was a kind of a really good example because the traditional knowledge labels when they were um, being put together were often being used for cultural heritage items. So, you know, something that had sat in a museum, the collection of 30 things here or something like this. And I know that the context you're working in is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of records. And what does it mean to try and think about this sort of application at a, at a scale? So really fortunate working with um, Aaron Walton um, and Holden at Manaki Whenua. Um, they were in the middle, or at least Aaron was in the middle of uh, really putting together their new systematics collection database uh, for all the national collections. And so the ones that sit there. And they decided that um, they would, uh, as they were doing that process, they would make that infrastructure or have that infrastructure enable the use of notices and labels there. Uh, this is, um, you know, really just an example. So this is the area of my community and um, Holden put together, this is what they already know based on kind of the GIS information, all the different samples that have been collected from our territories. Um, so you could, and he was starting to go through a process of doing this with a whole range of different communities. Um, because they were wanting to think about 
could they get involved in doing genetic, um, uh, starting to do gene sequencing of some of the uh, some of the samples which they were holding? And they didn't feel like they could just go and do that without. Um, so it was legacy samples, but they didn't feel they had the social license to do that activity without some kind of conversation. So he was going around saying, "Here's what we have. Um, how do you feel about getting involved in you know kind of some sort of project?" Uh, and this is a kind of you know quite a quite a long involved um, activity he was involved in. And if you look at the um, the systematics data collection, there's, there'll be an updated number because they're still doing more work at the moment. It's probably over seven hundred thousand, but at the time we were doing this last year, it was um, six hundred seventy one thousand records across those five national collections. And they've put um, biocultural notices on every single one of those records. Um, and then there's, can talk to you about how the process of the labels came about, but there's now 6,000 records with labels on it. Um, so what was created was a project for each of the collections. And so one of the things I'm conscious of is, um, and, and you'll be aware of, is every time you start to try and do something new with, uh, uh, with the way you organize your records, there's a lot of labor involved. And someone is the one that has to go through and, and, and do those changes. And then if we're trying to work with communities, who in the community is the one that's kind of involved with, with doing uh, bits of labor as well? So what we did was um, created a project uh, using the Local Context Hub, uh, which creates a notice. And that notice has a, um, a unique identifier. And that, that notice just gets propagated to every single record within that collection. Uh, so they essentially had five projects to cover uh, the 700,000 records. And uh, so you can see here, this is on, uh, on their record. Um, under the permissions, uh, they've got a project, which is the local context project, and then they show the biocultural notice. And so if you click on the project, uh, it will take you through to the project that's been set up on the local context site, uh, uh, which has the uh, kind of the ID and things there. And it runs with an API, which allows any kind of changes that get made in the local context system to be automatically updated into the uh, into Monarchy Fenua's database. And so uh, there's the biocultural notice there. So this is what anyone sees when they come and look at it. Um, if they look at the record and then they click on it, then the text comes up. So the notices there aren't, aren't uh, uh, they're not customizable. It's just kind of a standard notice, largely saying, hey, look, there's some interest that sit here. Um, and there may be a community that's involved with, with putting labels into place. So, how that then happens um, is, at least in terms of what Monarchy Whenua does, they've been working with uh, Native Lands Digital, uh, which has collected a whole range of different kind of GIS boundaries for different communities. Um, certainly in New Zealand, that's come about and often through treaty settlement processes and other things. And um, But they can use those uh, to create an overlay and identify the, the items that sit within it. So you can go onto their system and its collection database, uh, select the community, and it will give you the list of the give you the list of the items that sit in that space, which is showing up uh, showing up right here. And that's that bit. And then what we've then been able to do is uh, when the project's put together, and so. Uh, so for this, they then create, they've created, so you've got this project that's been created for each of the collections. As each of the communities have come along to work with Monarchy Whenua, Monarchy Whenua has then used that to identify the, the records that would sit within a collection that's a tribal specific collection. And that gets sent to us on the local context hub. And then, uh, as you can see there, biological specimens housed at Monarchy Whenua from the region of Whakatohia. And so they sent that project to us. We decided which labels we wanted to attach to all of those records as a group, not as in the, like separate for individuals, but as a group. And now on all of the 1,200 or kind of 2,000 records now, uh, those labels are sitting on all the records. And so anyone coming in that sees those, 
they can um, they can click on it and they'll see not only see what the project talks about but also what the labels are. Okay, so that and so that then is the the, the text that our community customised and now sits against each of those records. So, you know, I could run this through just on the website itself, kind of click and click and point and kind of show how it works. So it's um, it's actually been really, uh, really neat to work with uh, them around getting this together. And so far, there's three different communities that have then added labels. And so each of them have just gone through that same kind of process with Monarchy Fennel. And then as new communities come along, the infrastructure is already in place and it just becomes a process of setting up a project for them, allowing the community to go and do the things which they need to do around customizing their own labels, and then they can add it in. And so when we, um, when we added our labels on, they do the updates every evening and the next day, um, the, uh, the labels were just sitting on all the records. So it was kind of, kind of cool in that regard. And as they've been going through the digitization process uh, for, the, for the other records, Anything that sits within that boundary automatically attracts those uh, automatically attracts those notices as well. So, just in my final minute, because I already had the five minute a little while ago, um, sort of really trying to think through about not only about getting the the label in on the record, but then what it kind of moves through to, um, because the infrastructures, you know, there's all sorts of infrastructures that are sitting in place here. And so not only getting um, a notice and then labels and records, and this is an example um, of a Bilberry genome sequence and a notice that's sitting there. Uh, but then this data is used to generate a paper. The paper comes up here and it has the notice on the picture. And then it has a reference to it in the data availability statement. So we're working with publishers at the moment to try and work out, you know, what is the right way in which uh, these um, kind of labels and notices, if they're sitting in a record, should be represented as things are generated from it. Um, already done some work with DataSite, um, thinking about the, what's the preferred approach for, for recognizing the text and attributes. And um, also working in with ORCID, so people can connect into the local context hub using the ORCID uh, login, but really wanting to say if there's, if there's you know, researchers out that they're doing work with communities and putting notices and labels in place, that that can be sitting on their record as well. A uh, little bit of a, a flag about that they're doing good stuff. And you know, just, just working with other places um, around uh, what the labels might look like and how they can be represented in other in other spaces, whether it's JSTOR. But uh, this has really only come about by kind of working with groups. And so there's kind of different groups, whether it's been particular platforms or particular research groups um, that are really interested in um, how they can integrate that as a piece of the puzzle which they're working out. So, you know, Fair Island Biocode, they're doing stuff that's, you know, thinking about how their metadata is connected in different ways as they create a digital twin around um, an island in the, in the Pacific. Um, but knowing that they also have to have information about um, collection permits uh, for parts of the things that they're doing. And then this thing clicks through. It should show something about adding, you know, also adding kind of biocultural notices and labels into that mix too. So, you know, I think as we're trying to just think about kind of the rights, uh, you know, this bigger discussion, I know there's a big discussion happening here at the moment, but, you know, there's other conversations happening in lots of places around um, what sorts of rights and interests need to be recognized and expressed um, in relationships with indigenous communities. Um, and so that's a sort of an ongoing conversation, but really thinking about, what are the different ways in which those things can be acknowledged? And then we can start kind of um, moving up and you know, moving from acknowledgement. How does it you know, get in that space where there's more attribution in terms of the things that happen? What does that look like in terms of authorship? And you're starting to get you know, a few um, journals come out and say, you know, they won't, 
they won't publish indigenous content unless there's an indigenous author on the um, as a part of the team um, and then it gets into conversations around access as well so all of these things are uh, are ongoing but it's something which we're i think you know working our way through and um, happy to work with uh, any groups around how what that might look like in the future as well so just my final slide here um, so this is um uh, donald Soptima, and this is really kind of cool quote and this was talking about actually um, uh, one of the most powerful things they've experienced as a community was gifts coming back from their ancestors and so that was um, information items that have been collected sat in a museum and then came back and then they were able to engage with them and help with parts or you know parts of their own sort of cultural revitalization activities so um kia ora, thanks Thanks, Maui. Um, we do have an online question, which I think we'll start with, given give some precedent to the uh, online audience. So are you aware of any instances in which data tagged with the uncertain province designation were used but then needed to be mediated with Indigenous peoples or how data users might communicate with those peoples prior to using those data? Oh, that's probably enough. <laughs> Data tagged with uncertain provenance designation were used. Um, oh, yeah, look, so I think I, in lots of ways there's there's all sorts of data out there. I mean, they look at um, digital sequence information, a lot of the gene sequences that are sitting around the world. I think they say that there's about 17% of them that have the country of origin, not a community of origin. So, you know, there's lots of places where, you know, there's no provenance associated. That's going to be, you know, quite an issue if you start trying to think about how do we deal with benefit sharing and digital sequence information if that's sort of the situation? So, um, all of the uh, all of the uh, the records that Manaki Fenua held from things that were taken from our lands, we knew nothing about. Like they're just things that have been collected by people over the last 50, 60 years, um, because that was what you could do. You know, it was just sort of like um, how um, how things were sort of done in, in that time. So there's lots of places where that sits there. And the information that's often on the record is more about the collector rather than the community. And so this kind of mismatch around um, what things have been given value in the records and how do we think about that being rebalanced. And so I think, you know, the, um, in some ways, you know, the use of the notices and labels becomes just a part of that coming about. And, you know, it's not going to be the solution for everything. Um, but it will have, you know, kind of value in some places. We do have a question here. Um, can I ask everybody, before they ask their question, um, please introduce yourself so that those online can, um, and in the room, know who is speaking. Uh, thank you. My name is uh, Hank Bart from uh, the US, Louisiana. Um, fascinating talk. Um, second time I heard you speak, by the way. But my, uh, I love what you had to say about um, engaging indigenous people in how we document, you know, biodiversity records, when those uh, records have benefits to those indigenous people. My question is actually about cases where indigenous knowledge, and this happens in a lot of different cases, is lost. Mm. And yet some information on that knowledge is documented in biodiversity collections, mm. particularly anthropological or archeological. It's a great story about um, how um, in the Pacific Northwest of the US, North America, uh, they were able to restore this method of fishing for clams by studying um, logs that were used to trap uh, tides and build up sediment that the clams could live in. The tra traditional people in this part of North America had lost all knowledge of that method of fishing and that discovery from anthropology and archaeology actually helped them to restore that knowledge. Are, are there other examples like that that you're aware of where this collaboration between um, scientists, archaeologists, and Native people could help to restore lost traditional knowledge? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so the um, kind of the quote at the end was an example of a community that had, um, working with the Library of Congress, and it was around um, wax cylinders, and that held, held uh, they'd actually been they'd actually been collected because they were testing the technology 
and um, they'd taken these uh, recordings from the community of these songs. And those songs had actually been lost from the community over time. And so by engaging with the, uh, the Library of Congress and the researchers around that project, they were able to do this whole sort of exercise in terms of um, sort of revitalization of their understanding of the songs, integrate that into their way of teaching, you know, um, kind of kids and using it in the community, um, but then also create a better record because they were able to then, even though they'd lost it, they were able to then tell the, um, tell the Library of Congress um, what was on, you know, what the songs were about. And so the record became a um, kind of a more enriched one, which was of benefit to publics looking at it, but they also had this direct benefit as well. So, you know, there, there, you know there's some places where that's going to happen, and, you know, that's in lots of ways the best outcome um, if they're there. But it's, you know, the, the, it only comes about by the connection between those communities and, you know, these places. And what we're hoping is, in some ways by um, uh, making use of the system that it sometimes it's um, it's it embeds with the conversations that have already happened. So there's already a project going underway and they put the labels on it just sort of reflects the things that they've agreed to. We think it can also be a little bit of a pathway to establishing relationships as well. That there's a, you know, people are saying, actually, we're open to collaborate. There's these things here. We're making it easier for you to find come and talk to us and then we'll work out, you know, what the right way of dealing with it is. Hello, Justin Billing, Environmental Biosecurity Office in the Department of Agriculture, Forestry and Fisheries, Commonwealth. Um, I'm curious to know, thank you for the topics, great raising my awareness about data sovereignty from the Indigenous point of view. A lot of the data we see at the Commonwealth level is aggregated <laughs> multiple times. Do you see these notices and the, these metadata, this attribution, scaling up or continuing to stay with the data up to that aggregation level, or is it sort of lost after that first? Two um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we've, 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 we're having conversations about that as well, because you know it's obviously one of the kind of challenges to deal with. Um, we uh, have a uh, like a I don't know like a a meta label, so. And, and part of the idea is that if there is um, a kind of a whole series of records that are put together, which each all had their own individual um, labels, that uh, you'd just have a label on that just says that there's on the record, it would say, actually, this has been put together from something that has a whole lot of labels. And you'd click to that and it would point you to the list that then kind of says this community, these labels, this community, these labels sort of things. The, and I think that will work to a certain level. And then at some point, you know, it, it, it kind of isn't. But... One of the issues is that um, the source records remain. And so, you know, we're trying to deal with, you know, how things might be represented on the source records and then how things might be represented in any kind of derivative sort of products. And I think, you know, that'll be one of the kind of kind of the work on workouts sort of deal with as it comes along sort of sort of issues. Awesome. Uh, kia ora, Maori. Uh, nice to chat to you and good, uh, good talk. I just had some questions. Uh, sorry, I'm Jay. I'm working for the Department of Climate Change, Environment, Energy and Water here in Australia. Um, as a Kiwi myself, I wanted to ask a bit more New Zealand-specific questions. I wanted to know where the conversation's at with other museums and collections in New Zealand, like Te Papa, Niwa and Auckland Museum. Where those conversations are at and also what you see the next steps for the plan and implementing it with them would be? Yeah, so uh, the, some, some of these things tend to be kind of like slow burn things. I think there's been, the traditional knowledge labels have been around for a little while. Um, and so there is some sort of familiarity. I think the biocultural labels are, are newer. And so I think um, their, uh, I guess, awareness in these kinds of forum is, is probably more emergent. Um, I think there's, uh, what would I say? Um, everyone has wanted to see examples in practice because you want to know what are the implications for us in terms of the things that we have to do and, and what it might mean into the future. And I think depending on this sort of organization that has uh, different sorts of expectations, we've you know talked with some people at the Canadian government um, the other day and they're, 
they're pulling together a portal which shows you know all sorts of different research projects that have happened across the country um but they're they're not actually the group that collects the information has a direct relationship but they're wanting to represent this sort of information on how they then as the person that shares it with everyone else um deals with it so that's kind of one of the other things that we're you know having to think through because you're not always working directly with the community or the researchers around the collection event it's the aggregator later on that's pulling things together from a variety of places so how to you know what does was that that what does that start to look like um we've got a we've got a summit a local context summit at the end of november in wellington uh part of that is to profile a little bit more to some of the agencies but we've had um you know we've already talked to a lot of the cultural heritage agencies to papa have been involved in those um uh new zealand sound and vision ngā taonga um uh, auckland museum is already trying to think about how it applies with a couple of the projects they're involved with because usually you know we say start with something that's a pilot project that you've got a good relationship with the community so you can kind of get it into the system and then once it's in the infrastructure you can decide what your engagement process or availability for that with others looks like in the future kind of figure that's going to be a slow burn over time a little bit like manaki fenua they had three groups that were directly involved because we were involved in the pilot project but as we're doing training for other communities they're starting to approach and ask to um ask to do that as well and it's had seen the same thing in the library of congress they did the infrastructure working with one community and there's now about six or seven others over the last five years that have started to then put things in place too Oh. Please. 